Rabbit Test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 you will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a telephone service representative. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Cheap Calls Unlimited. This is Adam O'Shaughnessy. How can I help you? Yes, I heard something on the TV the other day about cheap local and national calls. Do you have a new offer available at the moment? That's right. You would have heard about our special no-limit offer. Oh, how does it work? How can I save? Well... Do you make many calls outside your local area? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. I often call my mother-in-law in Sydney, and sometimes I call Perth and Melbourne. We've got family there. OK. Where would you be calling from? Brisbane. Right. This would be perfect for you. How it works is you tell us which city you call the most, and we'll set up a special offer for three cents per minute, no matter what time of the day you call. But it gets better. We also offer 10 cent local calls. No other telephone carrier can offer you such a cheap plan. Wow, that is cheaper than what I currently pay. But what about international calls? I often call America. What are your rates to the States? Our rates to the USA are also competitive. You can call America for 6 cents per minute. This also includes a connection fee of 15 cents. That's competitive, all right. So, how do I sign up? Well. We can do it right here over the phone if you like. Or I can send you out an application form. Or I can email the details with a form attached. Which would you prefer? Well, how long will it take over the phone? Oh, just a matter of four or five minutes. OK, let's do it now. Right then. First off, I need your name and address. OK, my name is Mandy Silverstone. That's S-I-L-V-E-R-S-T-O-N-E. -E. My address is 16 Hazelwood Street, that's H-A-Z-L-E-W-O-O-D Street, Belmont, 4173. Good. Now what about your telephone number, date of birth, and do you have an email address? Yes. The telephone is 5522-3481. My date of birth is July 13, 1972, and my email address is mandy at telly.com. That's M-A-N-D-Y at T-E-L-E -E dot com. Why do you need my date of birth? Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Right, OK. Yes, we'll request your date of birth for security reasons. We'll ask you this each time you call us to request information about your account. Not for making a payment, but, uh, you know, if you wish to change any of your details or change your plan, you know, those kind of things. OK, I understand. OK, right. Well, we're finished. Do you have any other questions at all? Yes. When does this new service actually start? Yes, I'm going to send the information to our sales department. They'll process it today and your new service will be ready tomorrow. By next month, you'll really start to experience the savings. Fantastic. OK, well, that's all I wanted to know. Oh, when will I receive the bill? That'll be one month from the day you signed up. It'll be sent on the same day every month thereafter, unless you request a change. We can send them every two or three months if you prefer. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
do subscribe our channel and like the video so that we feel motivated and make more and more videos for you and please press the bell icon so that you can get notification for every new video which is absolutely free thanks now turns to part two part two You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, look at questions 11 to 13. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures. So I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now. They're a big store. And one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it. Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory. Or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study. Mm. And there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. 
The staff run an information skills program, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh, right. I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> And I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now, uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um... I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project, mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well, uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report, which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a talk about the food we eat. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Welcome to The Food We Eat, sponsored by Safeway. Increasingly, we know more about the effects of our eating habits and lifestyles on our health. While new information can change old ideas, the new stories can often be confusing. At Safeway, we try to help customers not only in the range and types of food offered, but also by providing up-to-date, reliable information in areas we know are of interest and which relate to the diet we eat. Today, we are going to talk about sugar. Recently, doctors have been advising us to eat less sugar. The health recommendation to use less sugar 
is for two reasons. Firstly, for the sake of our teeth, since the amount and frequency of sugar consumption links to decay. Secondly, as sugar is a good source of calories, it can easily be a problem if we tend to be overweight. The dental risk is because bacteria which occur naturally in our mouth feed on carbohydrates, sugar and starch, to form plaque and acid. Plaque is a sticky coating that prevents the bacteria being removed by saliva. The acid attacks the tooth itself. This takes time, however, so the trick is to avoid sticky foods like sweets, which stay around in crevices feeding the bacteria. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Regular brushing, preferably with a fluoride toothpaste, helps remove particles and resist acid. The worst thing you can do is nibble sweet things between meals. It puts your teeth under constant attack. A sweet tooth develops gradually. And you might be surprised at how you can steadily unlearn the taste, taking in fewer calories and saving your teeth. Here's some ways. A. Gradually cut down the sugar in tea and coffee till you can stop altogether or switch to sweetness. B. Choose snacks with a lower sugar content. Fresh fruit, raw vegetables, crackers. Milk or low-flat natural yoghurt. Remember, some fruits like raisins have lots of sugar. C. Look for reduced sugar alternatives. There are more and more around, from diet drinks to yoghurts, even jams and sauces. D. Try gradually to cut back on the sugar you use in cooking, especially in baking. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Hear a lecture on the research on teen brain. Now you have half a minute to read the questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Today our guest is Joseph Parks, Medical Director for the Botany Department of Mental Health. He's going to give a lecture about the research on teenage brain. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to introduce the new research about adolescent mind, the teenage brain. 
How much do you know about that? Do you believe in brain scanning? Do you think we can judge whether a teen is normal or mentally ill? Or it's just another immature test? The new research shows a teen brain is in the middle of disordered changes. Those changes, scientists now believe, are so significant that they may reveal the mysteries of mental illness, explaining why some teens commit suicide, why others harm their classmates, and why some emerge later in life with mental disorders. The research looks forward to a day when teens could be tested for suicidal depression as easily as they are for heart disease. But there are signs that society, and parents in particular, would reject such a tool. Many parents question the validity of a mental health diagnosis. They fear that their children will be falsely tagged with a mark that he or she is abnormal. At the centre of the debate is the teen brain. Its confusing architecture and the difficult question of what's typical in a teen and what's not. Under the old thinking, the adolescent brain was fully formed, needing only to be filled with facts, figures, and experiences to become an adult mind. At the same time, many people rejected the idea that young people were even capable of developing mental illnesses. However, the new research shows a teenage brain is an organ in transition. It has an unstable and vulnerable composition. The evolving teenage brain clearly isn't adult-like until the early 20s. If teens act young and stupid, it may be because brain areas that govern rational thought are not mature yet. All that is fine when the brain develops normally. But if the teen brain fails to successfully reinvent itself as an adult brain, mental illness may happen. Researchers increasingly believe if that process stops for some reason, teens are likely to develop mental illness. Early warning signs might be disregarded, as adults may think them the typical teen behaviours. Perhaps the chief hope of the new research is that it could make a difference for teenagers suffering from mental disorder and major depression. These can lead to suicide, which for years has been the leading cause of death for teens. Until recently, scientists couldn't peer into living brains to look for changes associated with normal development or mental diseases. That is beginning to change, as researchers develop ever more sensitive brain scanners. However, the composite pictures are somewhat misleading. A snapshot of an individual brain may fall somewhere between normal and mentally ill. For now, psychiatrists and psychologists must still rely on interviews and observations of children's behaviour to diagnose mental illness. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.